Prepare to step into a world where imagination knows no bounds as we present Legends Loot and Lore. Join your hosts, Andrew and Joe, the dice-rolling dynamic duo who will guide you every step of the way into the realm of Dungeons & Dragons. From crafting narratives to character creation, this podcast is your gateway to becoming the hero of your own story. Whether you're a new adventurer or a seasoned traveler seeking new insights, Legends, Loot, and Lore has something for everyone. After the episode, visit our website at www.legendslootandlore.com for even more resources and exclusive content. And if you're as passionate about this adventure as we are, help support our quest at legendslootandlore.supercast.com. Embark on this odyssey with us and let the echoes of ancient tales guide you toward a destiny filled with limitless possibilities. Roll for initiative, because your adventure begins now. Joining the podcast today is Elsie Farrell, who is a, let's see if I can get all these things down now, uh, storyteller, author, uh, game master, uh, pet parent, um, <laughs> resident of New Jersey, which is always good. I, I, I yep. always I always count that on the plus side. Um, <laughs> what else? What else, Elsie? What am I missing? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I think you got most of it. Uh, content creator for ttrpgs but yeah that's pretty much everything so you've been so so in our conversations you've been creating this homebrew setting for over 15 years now can you tell us a little bit about a little bit about that sure so the world that i'm currently working in um what my players and readers are familiar with is the world of Veritas, mm -hmm. which is actually a small river valley in this much larger multi-continent kind of planet um, called Andromara. And I initially started writing out Andromara in 2015. Um, a group of my friends wanted to kind of really sink into a campaign. So right. I created the setting and in my kind of young DM days, uh, uh -huh. said, here's a boat, here's a map, off you go. Um, and then reaped the consequences immediately. <laughs> and so, All right. um, but for good, I think the first campaign probably lasted about three years, mm -hmm. um, where they bounced around to different locations in the world. And then that campaign came to a close. And when I was looking at kind of doing my next thing, I really wanted to focus in on just one small area and kind of go really deep into the lore instead of more wide. Right. Um, and that's how Veritas has really built itself out is, um, especially over the pandemic, running so many different groups and mini campaigns and longer campaigns in this world um it's kind of fleshed itself out fascinating so so how many how many campaigns would you say you've run within within veritas the world in in the world that you have you've created um so probably three that had any kind of like lasting mm -hmm. um and then because of the nature of what I do as a professional dm I'm running almost constant one shots in the world as well okay. so uh, once or twice a week, there's a one shot that's happening in the world. So let's let's talk about that. So you, so let's let's talk about your your journey as as a as a DM. And so you started out over over. Well, you started your homebrew over 15 years ago. Was that your start in DMing, or or how did you get started in DMing? How did you get to where you are now? Because now you are a, a professional DM working with Dungeons and Drafts. So you, you've got that whole aspect. And then what what kind of what kind of inspired you to start there? And and how did you how did you move along that pathway? Yeah, so uh, I started DMing as a teenager, but my journey with DD actually started much earlier. My dad played DD. In the he started with other TTRPGs, but played D and D right. in the eighties and nineties. Oh, cool! And so my childhood was really built around listening to my dad DM for his group, right? 
Um, that's what Saturday nights were. We're <laughs> listening to my dad tell stories to uh-huh. his friends. Oh, neat. Um, Hanging out with my dad meant, you know, we had a D&D room in our house where there were homebrew maps and dragon magazines and oh, wow. miniatures everywhere. Oh, very cool. Um, yeah, I was given my first set of rule books and a dice set and the first three Dragonlance Chronicles at eight. Um, <laughs> so awesome. it was really, yeah. So growing up, D&D was just, it was part of my childhood mm-hmm. and as somebody who looks up to her dad a great deal, um, I wanted to be a storyteller like him. So in my earlier, in my childhood and in my early teenage years, I played D&D, but my goal was to be a DM. That was the that was the end thing that right. I could do was I could be a DM like my dad. So when I was a teenager... Um, I started finding friends who were into TTRPGs and I have a younger brother who also plays and he has a bunch of friends that play and we're close enough in age that there was overlap. So um, really, I guess from the time I was like 17, there was just constant, we had, like I said, a and d room in our house right. and it was just like on any given day of the week, some game was being run out of that room between my dad, me or my brother. That's amazing. Um, that's 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 great that you have all that in common with your with your family. It really, it's, it's got to be a great bonding experience, and just it, it's just it's just nice to have those. Not not only I, I guess during the time that's happening, but the memories as well going on to to have that that kind of connection with with your family to to be able to share that. That's fantastic. It's really incredible because um, I mean. You know, I have memories like me, my dad and my brother went to Gen Con 50 together. Mm -hmm. And so like that is a memory that I'm going to cherish for the rest of my life. And we play, um, we all still play together. We each run a different campaign and we play in one another's campaigns. But just like, you know, sometimes hanging out is dinner and then we paint minis after or... (laughs) um, you know, just constantly talking D and D. All of the stuff that I do when it comes to my own like home brewing or module writing, things like that. Like I send them to my dad, and I'm like, "Hey, what do you think of this? How would you run it?" Right. Um. So yeah, there's just a very, very D and D is is very central to to my family unit, um, and it's been a big part of the bond that I have with, especially my brother and my dad. Right. Um. But my brother, my my mom uh, will like sit down. She doesn't play, but she sits and she's like, I just like listening to you guys be, uh, <laughs> be passionate. So. <laughs> that's great. Oh, that's fantastic. So how did you, so how did you transform this, this kind of family, family playing and playing with friends and family? How did you translate that into becoming a, a professional DM? How did that, what, what, what did that, what did that pathway look like for you? the first like seven to 10 years, it was just, you know, family and friends Mm -hmm. and it was getting around the table and ordering pizza and playing. Um, But it was really the pandemic in, I think conjunction with um, Dungeons and Dragons came out with their fifth edition, right? Which was a much more digestible edition, I think for people to get into Mm -hmm. Um, at this around the same time, stranger things came out. Yes. So then a lot more people were suddenly. It, it, yeah. It, it, so it was, it, was, it, became, the, it became, became, became part of the dialogue that, pe- that people were familiar with because mm-hmm. it, it was, it was such a part of the, such a part of the show. So with all, but yeah, with the show's popularity, I kind of dragged, uh, dragged D and D along with it. Absolutely. And um, so you had stranger things. And so, you know, D and D, which has always been a have, a uh, hobby with like the satanic panic kind of attached to it right. really started to lift out of that, that misconception and that reputation. Um, at the same time you have critical role and dimension 20 and all yes. of these other actual plays happening. And then the pandemic happens yes. and we're all home. <laughs> <laughs> right. And the, the any DM, D&D player will tell you the biggest obstacle to playing D&D is finding the time on the schedule for everybody to show up and play D&D. Tell me about and it. <laughs> I, can, I can relate. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, and all of a sudden we all had all this time. And then between Discord, Zoom, Roll20, and D&D Beyond, mm-hmm. the tools to play virtually were so strong. Um, yeah, everything really seemed to come together just just at the right time. It really, it coalesced in a way that I think was very unique and I'm so grateful for it because it was such a challenging time. Yeah. And D and D, between listening to, uh, you know, like Critical Role during the day right. and playing D and D and having the books to read and talking to people online and like it really kind of became that lifeline of it was something to do and something to think about that was a net positive. Absolutely. Um, and so, and through that. I ended up talking to a lot of people who weren't typically interested in playing D and D, but suddenly they were like, Hey, I've always been kind of curious. I'd love to give it a try. So I found myself running multiple games a week Mm -hmm. for people who had never touched a set of dice before, or had never seen a character sheet. So my schedule was filled with, you know, having video meetings with people and running session zeros and talking about, well, okay, imagine imagine yourself in this fantasy setting. If you were a hero, what would your ideal hero look like? Right. And um and then just bringing these groups together and and just rolling dice digitally and and playing games and uh so then as things started to kind of even back out and, and approach normality and we can go back to restaurants and <laughs> right. things like that. Um, I know I personally kind of struggled with the like, Oh, it, you can leave your house again. <laughs> so yeah, that was, that was a big, I think it was a big adjustment for everybody. It's like, wait a second, wait a second. Is this, this is, was normal, but it hasn't been normal for a couple of years now. So it, it, it started. It was a very foreign experience going going back out into the real world for sure. It really was, and it was such an adjustment. And I found myself really kind of reticent and not going out as much as I used to. Right. Um, and so I found out about this thing called Dungeons and Drafts, um, which is it's in. They've recently expanded. It started in Philadelphia. It's mm-hmm. in South Jersey. It's in New York City. It's in Pittsburgh. Um, basically, we go to local breweries. Uh, it's usually three or four DMs. We set up for the night. People sign up uh, for tables of typically four to six. Mm-hmm. And we create your characters. We bring dice for you to roll with. Um, and we play D&D for like three or four hours. You get to hang out at a local brewery. You get to try their their stuff. And I mean, Thomas and, and Des, who came up with it, wow. uh, absolutely brilliant. So, and it's been such a fun experience. And so I, I heard about it. I had a conversation with Tom, uh, just kind of talked about what my general vibe was as a DM. And uh, yeah, basically he gave me the go ahead and that was in March of this year. And uh, now I, I run a game a week for them for the most part. That's and fantastic. Have the summer. That's that is that is so cool. I I love the idea of bringing bringing Dungeons and Dragons, bringing tabletop role playing games to more uh, familiar environments. You know, it's not it's not your it's it's not your parents' basement anymore. Uh, you <laughs> yeah. know, so it it, it is it, it it's definitely become more. Uh, more of a cultural phenomenon. So how do you, so talk to me a little bit about more about um, get, getting those beginners, getting those people, you know, curious that, that, that are, that have heard of D and D have never played and really kind of want to want to give it a shot. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about Dungeons and Drafts is a lot of the people that come to the table, you kind of get two groups. You get the groups that come to a ton of Dungeons and Drafts events. Okay. And so you see them over and over again and they mm-hmm. try different DMs and you have people that come to the table and they have never played D and D ever. They might not even have the, they might have like the most vague idea of what it is. Right. I ran a table last week where five of my players had never even touched dice. And then also on top of that, you know, with mm-hmm. Dungeons and Drafts, they're showing up and you have three or four hours to play a game right so there's we don't have session zeros there's not a lot of intro time so 
as that's kind a, of like throwing him into the deep end, almost like we're, we're really just going going straight into this. It's like buck, buckle up. <laughs> Absolutely, and so it's my job as the DM. I, I do a couple things. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first is I know their character sheets, so. Um, because for them and for anybody who's picking up a character, like typically what I do is is everybody sits down. I for a game of six, I have nine or ten character sheets and they get like 15, 20 minutes to kind of pick through. I'll ask them what their play style is and try to kind of help direct them. Um, typically, if I have a beginner player, I'm like, please, for the love of all that is holy, do not pick the wizard. Um, <laughs> you're, you're not going to have a good time. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and just kind of like sit with them and, and, you know, help them help guide them to right. a, a character that I think is either going to go really well with the story that I know I'm telling that night, mm-hmm. or that I think is going to match the type of hero that they want to be. Um, or villain, depending on on fair, the flavor of what fair we're doing. Fair point. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, but so I'm very familiar with the characters. Okay, so, for good. example, yeah. So, like, when I have, I know I have a dragonborn paladin. I know that they have a breath weapon. Um, when I have a, a person who's playing a hell dwarf, I know that they have stone cunning. So I can kind of prompt them or remind them like, like, Hey, you're the rogue, by the way, you can take, um, you can take hide disengage as a bonus action. So then you get sneak attack next round. And that's really going to boost the attack damage that you're able to do. So it allows me to kind of guide them as the DM, like, Hey, you know, you actually have these abilities and also really let them know, like, I don't expect you to know these abilities. Right. I'm not expecting <laughs> you. Like, <laughs> it's my job. And right. I tell them that right. when they sit down. I'm like, it's my job to let you know what you can do. Sure. Read up and and figure out what you can. But, you know, we're going to work through this together. d d is about collaborative storytelling. Together, we're going to tell a kick-ass story. My job is to help you tell an amazing story. So That's, um, that's really helpful that, that you you have an understanding of what their characters are. So Mm -hmm. yeah, so you can, you can really kind of lead the conversation. So instead of them coming, coming to the table with a character they created and you're trying to learn four or five people's characters suddenly, yeah, you know, you know, all the characters backgrounds already. So I, I, that's probably very helpful for, for somebody unfamiliar with D and D to be like, Oh, I can do that. That's cool. So I can, I can really see how that would be, that that that's almost that's almost instead of a session zero, you kind of mm-hmm. created everything ahead of time. That's that's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's it's definitely helpful because again, like you just said, like we don't have that session right, zero. Right, right. Um, so that time where I'm usually sitting down with a player and getting to know their play style or what kind of direction they want to go to, or you know, even with a lot of the virtual games I run, I have their character sheets up on D&D Beyond. I have the whole party up and I can flip right. between them and see what they can do. So this kind of acts as a intermediary step. And then another really big thing is a lot of times there's a couple things. Uh, mm-hmm. The panic for players when they realize, like when you say, make this kind of check. Right. And they don't know where to look for that. uh uh-huh. Um, I have become like a flight attendant when it comes to character sheets. I'm like, turn to page three, go to the top left, top right. Like, <laughs> this is where you're going to find that stat. Right. Uh, your, your skills and your skills are in alphabetical order. So you want to go under I and really kind of like when I ask for a role, I make sure that I'm also telling them where to find that number right. and what they're rolling. And so I try not to leave them guessing with what it is, what mechanic they're trying to do. I just tell them off the bat um, because that I always feel so bad for a player when you say like, oh, do make an attack roll. And you see that moment of panic where they're like, where do I where do I find that? Right. And I I, I see that. I see that a lot. Even even in our games, even even (laughs) after even after we played for years, they're like, wait a second, what? Like, which which yeah. which dice is which die is that? 
it's because it's so many rules yes. and depending on yes. where you get your character sheet from things can be in different places right. and um you know as soon as you level up numbers change so um and then the other thing that i i do is if i see that there's a little bit of analysis paralysis happening mm-hmm. at the table where everybody's kind of talking but they're not really sure what to do or what they can do especially for a new player they don't realize exactly how open world D and D is. That it's like, no, right. you can literally do anything. Sometimes I'll make suggestions. Yeah. So if there's a wall that they have to get over, I can go. If you've got a rope or a grappling hook, you can use that. You can try to climb the wall. You can summon a rhinoceros because you have this spell, and you can try to <laughs> bust through the wall. You can try to acrobatics over you can climb a tree like i'll give three or four suggestions right. some good some bad they don't know which is good and which is bad but um try to give them a couple suggestions just to sort of plant the seed of like these are the options that you have and you can work within those options or you can do something else and 95 percent of the time the players do something not listed um which is great that's what you want but um, but at least giving the options kind of starts the the thought process of um, of the more complex problem solving that <clears throat> some you just sometimes you just don't know that you can do it if right. you're used to a board game. Yeah, it, it's very true. But I mean, like you said, the, the the possibilities really are are endless. What you what you can do, you're you're only limited by your imagination, and mm-hmm. I think. I, it, it's funny to see how, 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 as campaigns have gone on, how, how kind of, how, how, how the creative, how the creative problem solving kind of expands over, over time. Because initially it's like, well, you, you're not entirely sure. And by the end of it, you're like, you're like coming up with the most, most convoluted plans <laughs> for, like, most complicated way to climb a wall. Like, absolutely it's so funny so i I think it's it's got to be really it's 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 a great i think it's a great exercise for anybody to to work on on problem solving skills and 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 creative thinking you know playing playing dungeons and dragons i think there's a lot of benefit that it has out outside of the world of gaming um i in in all my research for the podcast i've seen I've seen a lot of different things. How, how have you gotten any of that feedback from players in your games as to kind of kind of what what impact D and D has had on them, or 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 what kind of responses have you gotten from your your beginner players af- after after session one? What is what is kind of their reaction after they they've had had their first taste of D and D? So I think the reaction I get a lot of the time is just, that was really fun, (laughs) which, Uh I mean, it sounds kind of almost silly to call that out, to be like, oh, I had it, like, oh, they had a good time, and that's that's the valuable feedback. But for D&D, like, it is a very complex game, and it has a steep learning curve. So if you can get somebody to, after three hours, go, I really had a good time, I enjoyed myself, um... That to me, that is that is the win. Right. Um, and then also, when uh, sometimes I have players ask me questions about like, well, how do you think this NPC would have reacted to this thing that we did, or yep. uh, what do you think my character would have eventually done with this thing? Um, and so already seeing that like that buy in and that takeaway from a one shot and a piece of paper that they picked up three hours before, um, that's. To me, that's amazing, and that makes me hope. Like, okay, cool. Maybe you'll either come to another event, or you'll find other friends that want to play, and you guys will run something together. Or, you know, maybe you know, just planted that seed for a for an awesome new hobby. Do do you do you see a lot of them? Do you see a lot of the the first timers coming back, or 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 do they or do they kind of roll in and out with with uh, with other first timers? What's what what do you what do you see as that kind of um, interaction when they after after they played their first game so we get a lot of um we get a lot of returning players Mm -hmm. which is awesome i've had players yeah i've had players that have come and sat at my table multiple times um it was funny last night i ran a game and i had a player that had run the 
one shot that I was doing, he had run it two weeks ago uh-huh. with me. And so he came over to my table and he was like, oh, guys, this is a really good story. You're going to have a lot of fun. Um, and then wandered back off to the other DM that he was uh, sitting it. with that night. That's great. So, yeah, which is just as a storyteller um, is just so awesome. Um, you know, he played my one shot three week, two, three weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And so for him to still be like remembering it enough that he was able to walk up and I didn't have anything set up. And he was like, oh, it looks like you're doing this. You're running this this game again. I'm like, oh, yeah. It's like, oh, that was so much fun. (laughs) So it's just it's it's just it's so awesome. Um, And it's so much fun. And it's great to see players return. And my favorite thing when we get the the table breakdown um, is seeing that somebody's on their sixth or seventh or tenth event, and they just keep coming back to to play with us. That's fantastic. That's I there there yeah. are I I completely agree with you. There are, there are so many memories that get made at the tables, and and it's it, it must be really gratifying as a as a DM to really get that get that feedback from from players who who have played played with you uh, to to really know that. You 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 you've made that kind of impact on on them, so that that that's that's a, such a such a fantastic feeling to to have. I'm sure. Now, do you run your do you run your your one shots within within your within your world, or is it or is it a D and D environment? What's is it is it Veritas, or is it something else that you do when you do the the games at the breweries? And the, so they're all in Veritas. Oh, cool. Oh, actually, so, so that's that's even better because it's, it's something you've put your heart and soul into, and and they're and they're really giving you that feedback that that they're having a great time and loving what you're loving what you, you you've done. It's it's so amazing, and it also helps me deepen the lore of the world mm-hmm. in a way that as a writer writing novels, you don't get that opportunity, like when I'm writing a novel, it's me and the characters and the setting and we're figuring it out together, but it's all in my head. So it's all one perspective and me just trying to, you know, move stuff around as I, as I can. When I'm DMing, I'm dropping characters in and I get to see what they're doing, how they're interacting. And it lets me breathe life into these settings and look at settings and characters in a much more dynamic way that sometimes as a writer, you're looking at a scene as a like, okay, I need, I need the blocking of the scene to go like this. I need the arc of the scene to look a certain way. Mm -hmm. Um, But when I have players interacting with a, eccentric uh academic and archaeologist and they're asking all these questions and they want to know about her history and what she's researching it's it it really prompts me to deepen that character and and also um it gives me a chance to create more dynamic characters that just because they are acting a certain way in in the in the series mm-hmm. in the novels a different character interacting with them in a different way is going to bring out a different dynamic to the characters. So they're more fleshed out. They're more um, well-rounded and dynamic. So talk, so talk to me about this. So now you've been, you've been developing um, this, this, this campaign setting for, for years now. And now, so you've written, you've written a novella, which was, which was really good. I I really enjoyed it. Um, Thank you. I I've got many, not many questions, but I've got a few questions. Um, but how, 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 how do you blend the, the, the world you've created? Because it, it's a dynamic environment when, when you've got people playing in it. So, so how mm-hmm. do you, how do you balance that dynamic environment to, to what you're writing in the novella? And you're also working on a novel, which comes out in February, I believe. Is that correct? Yes, February thirteenth. Excellent. So tell us, tell us about the novella. Tell us about the novel, and and tell us then how. Tell talk about the balance between the 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 books and and the dynamic world that that players are a part of. Yeah, absolutely. So the whole thing with the novels started when a friend of mine 
who has played in almost every campaign that I've run in this world, mm -hmm. uh, I, I turned to him one day and I said, you know, I really think I'd like to try. I've talked my entire life about <laughs> telling stories, writing books. Uh -huh. I think I really am going to buckle down and do it. And he said, you have an entire world you've already created. He's like, it's, it's right there. Yeah. Use that. Absolutely. That's, so, that's, a, that's a fantastic, fantastic starting point. Ab and it, it never occurred to me. <laughs> so, uh, like it really, it really well, did not well, occur to me. Well, thank God so, for your friend to point that out. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, he's mentioned in the acknowledgments <laughs> quite a few times. <laughs> um, so I started, you know, kind of looking at, well, what story could I tell in this world? Mm -hmm. And at this point I had run a couple different campaigns. I had these different areas kind of fleshed out and came up with that story. And as I was writing the novel, um, it, I was also running one shots. And so what I would do is I would come up with an area and then I'd be like, well, I'm really kind of curious to see what this would look like if people were running around in it. Mm -hmm. So let me take this setting and run something there and see what the characters make of the setting and see what sticks out to them and what they engage with um, and which NPCs that they meet, they find interesting. Um, and so it really became this, like I got to see what elements of the world people were connecting with. So um, in the novel, there's, you know, there's a short scene with a um, with a man who drives a ferry, and I have I ran an entire uh, encounter mm -hmm. where a bunch of my players almost sank his boat. Oh no! So, <laughs> and uh, during a rainstorm, they paid him to take them out, and his boat <laughs> almost sank, and there was a whole rigmarole. And oh boy! But, like, <laughs> as as you know, as D and D players are wants to tend to do sure um it's rare they touch an nbc's lives in a good way uh <laughs> usually it's chaos <laughs> but it just let me kind of flesh out these different elements and then as i was working on this larger novel um which is book one in what is going to be probably at least a five book series um wow all right I, that, that, yeah that i have be busy for a while <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Um, but the, so in the indie author industry, there's a lot of kind of rules over like how much you need to be producing content. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I, I kind of need, I need an introduction into my world. I need something that as I'm trying to get people to connect with me as a writer, I need to be able to point them to something so they know what my style is going to be. Right. Um, you know, you're out there and you're marketing yourself, but I wanted to be able to give something. Mm -hmm. So last summer, I kind of took six weeks and I wrote the novella and just kind of trial by fire the whole process. Yes. Um, so the novella is going to be a tie in in book two or three. Um, so the characters in you mean, the novella. You mean I've got to wait to book two or three to find out what happens? Yeah, unfortunately. Oh, come on, that's no fair. <laughs> um, so, you know, and it's kind of, so the plan is there's going to be a series of novellas that tie into mm -hmm. different important locations in the world. And then the protagonists from the novels will visit those locations and interact with those characters over time. Excellent. Um, well, that sounds, that sounds really interesting. So let's, so let's start. So, so start off. So the light keeper is is the novella. So yes. so so give give us the brief synopsis of of who the lightkeeper is and and kind of kind of what the don't don't give anything away cuz I don't want to give anything away either. I I thoroughly enjoyed it and and I'm dying to read more. So so give us the brief synopsis who who is the lightkeeper? So the lightkeeper is a woman named Lenora. Her family they are the keeper of the Alondra beacon and essentially what their job is, is they keep ships out of this particularly dangerous cove. Um, and so Lenora 
grew up with this responsibility. Her parents were the light keepers before her. She took over and her parents have passed and she can't leave her beacon. She has a small cottage. She Mm -hmm. has to be completely self-sustaining. And every night she has to keep vigil over her cove, make sure the light is lit and make sure that, um, that no one, no ships cross into, into the cove. Um, And then one night, she is she encounters a woman who walks down the beach and kind of changes everything for her and makes her realize how lonely she is and kind of tests her sense of duty Mm -hmm. and this other character is going through a a parallel journey at the same time but through a different set of circumstances. Excellent. It, it really is. I loved it. It, it the, the, the thing that, that kind of the parallel that I drew to this story that from another story, I, I thought of, I thought of Belle and beauty and the beast when, when she talks about, I want adventure in the great wide somewhere in the song. Like, I, and like, that's how, yep. like that, that's how I feel. And is, is like, she, 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 she sees something beyond the uh, the provincial life of of her her solitude there at the cottage and mm-hmm. and the beacon and and get sees that there's more and 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 grows grows the the fire within her to to learn about that grows more and it was it was such a it was such a great story I I really enjoyed reading it and sadly I guess I have to wait till book two or three to to find out what happens uh, from from the end of that story so I'm I'm excited. Thank you so. I, I it it's such a pleasure to me to hear that you read it and enjoyed it. Um, because again, it was such a just dipping my toes in the water sure, and yeah. trying to figure it out and trying to figure out how Amazon Kindle worked and <laughs> uh-huh. you know, like I I didn't want when you self publish, um, you know, when you publish traditionally, yes. You have a team, they do the marketing, they do the editing, they do the layout, they design the cover, they do the whole kit and caboodle for you. You basically, you edit the draft and they do the rest. When you self-publish, when you're an indie author, you do all of it. <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I, I, I can relate from running, from running the podcast, everything, it's, mm-hmm. you're, you're a one-man operation, it's, or one-woman operation in, in your case, so um yeah, it's, it's it's not easy. So that's that's I'm I, I I love the I love the cover art. So who was that? Thank was that you. your design? Yes, I I, I love this. I from <laughs> from the cover art to the story. I I, I really liked it. Um, so how so these characters are are these were these characters in your in your homebrew world or were these new characters for the novella? They were new characters for the novella, but mm-hmm. now. I have modules and one shots that run adjacent to that world and that cove. So I've run players through, um, through adventures where they can meet those characters. I would, or they're in the forest nearby. That's that's yeah. So I'm I'm <laughs> I would if you if you run it online, I would I would love the opportunity to to play in that world. I'm, I'm very eager to learn more about it. Um, it's, it, it sounds very interesting. Um, I love, I, there, there was, there was, there was really so much depth to, to the novella. It, it really, it really felt like a, it, it felt like a novel, even, even, even in, in its, in its short form. I, I felt like there was, I I really connected with the character. Sorry to keep on going about this. I just I I just really <laughs> I I was a, I became a fan. I I really enjoyed the characters. I I really even even within the the few short pages, I I really felt like there were, there was a lot of character development, a lot of a lot of background to them. Um, I I it was it was really well well conceived and well put together, and I'd lo- I'd love to get the chance to to play in that world as a as as a pc as a player character so um please if if you if you do have the if you do run yeah. one sometime i would i would love to play absolutely we will set something up fantastic <laughs> so so how 
So tell, so tell me how has, or has in general, has the, has the playing, the, 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 the one shots, the modules, the campaigns, everything that you've run in your world, how has that, ha, has that shaped your writing at all? Like, has it, has it changed things that, that you were working on or, or how, how have, how have the two kind of worked, worked together? Yeah, so basically I run the two on slightly altered, not altered, but slightly different timelines. Mm -hmm. So when my players are going through a one shot, they're typically going through an area about six months to a year before the protagonists in my novels would encounter them. Got it. I see. Interesting. So the protagonists in the novels, uh, Sidra and Theodora, they're going to be moving through Veritas as the book series continues. And so the players, when they play in my one shots, they're really helping me kind of uh, fill out what those areas are and, mm-hmm. and what they look like. And I really am hoping that if any of my players become readers as they read, they find some Easter eggs <laughs> from whatever oh, mischief they've caused uh-huh, because they're uh-huh. going to be in there. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that'd be great. Um, I, I love, I love that. And, and it's, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm uh, to me, I want very much to be a writer I love being a writer, but D and D and tabletop role playing games to me that's that's the base. That's where uh, I'm going to wax a little poetic here, but I, I think that storytelling is communal. Mm-hmm. It's something that as human beings for thousands of years, like we've gathered together and told stories together, and I think that that's the way stories are supposed to be told is communally. So as a writer, that community isn't. It's present, but it's present in a very different way where you write something, you put something out, and then the community comes after. But with D&D, you're building that story together. And so to have the opportunity to create a world where I get to do kind of that community storytelling and um, and have that back and forth dynamic and then write in that setting is such a gift and it's something that really I think helps me take my storytelling to another level and I think it also gives me a lot more empathy and sympathy to my different characters um, Mm -hmm. that maybe they would have just been a person on a page but because I have the other uh, interactions kind of in my mind, it gives me a little bit more depth to work with. That's great. Yeah. It's yeah. It it must be interesting to see how, like I said, how those players interact with your world. And I I definitely, I definitely agree. It would give you a much better understanding of, or, or deeper feel for, or who those characters are. They're not just, they're not just two dimensional. They really become three dimensional characters when you when you've got an actual person playing that part or interacting with that with that part so so let me ask this question so so speaking about people interacting with your world so so tell me tell me some of your your most memorable moments of of players in in your world what 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 sorts of things have have happened that 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 really stick out in your mind over over the years of 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 managing this 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 world. So, oh gosh, there's been so many. Um, <laughs> I'm sure. So I think, and some of them are are connected to the world themselves, and some of them are are how the world affected the characters. Mm-hmm. I think that's it. There's such an interplay. Sure. Um, the fairy master is a big one where, you know, as a, as a writer, typically it's just a guy who drives a ferry, right? Like that's uh-huh. his job. Right. Um, and instead, as I'm writing, I had players who almost sank his ship, almost took his livelihood from him. They almost died in the process. Like oh my. it creates 
Um, and and the implications of, you know, this is a fairy master along one of the main trade routes in the world. So what does that do? Right. Um, to the, like, you know, not that the local economy is particularly interesting for Dungeons and Dragons or for a novel, but <laughs> that it affects people. Absolutely. It's um, like your, your, your actions have consequences. Absolutely. Or um, I had players who kind of left, they, they turned over a, one stone too many. And <laughs> kind of started burying into <laughs> a, a depth of lore that speaks to the fact that Veridus is not um, is not the first iteration of the place that they're in. Okay. That there was an age before. Right. Yes. So interesting. And seeing, yes, yeah, so, and seeing them kind of interact with that and grapple with that. Um, I love putting moral quandaries in games. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's something that connects players and giving them that, um, that moment of having to make a tough choice can be really, really powerful. And especially in communal storytelling, because right. my favorite moment as a DM is when I'm not doing anything, when I'm sitting back and I'm listening to the players talk to one another. And the longer they're talking without me getting involved, to me, the better. That's success. So I love those storytelling moments where I'm sitting back and they're just talking to one another. I remember one of my parties, it was a particularly role-play heavy group. And the story was two of the characters um, had come from a religious temple and the one was on a kind of like a, a religious mission mm -hmm. and the other one was serving as his bodyguard. And for the start of what they were doing, everything that they were kind of encountering was, it might've been a little bit challenging, but for the most part, they were able to clear it and overcome. Right. And then they started getting kind of deeper and deeper into the world without realizing that, you know, they're slowly getting in over their head because they still had that that beginner's confidence <laughs> um, <laughs> that <laughs> that low level characters often have, where right. it's like I've got a sword and I and I can see that I can hit stuff with it. So, um, and the two of them and the rest of the party they got attacked by uh, these higher level bandits, right. and their their attempts at there was like a strategy that they had that broke down very quickly and the religious character almost died he was rolling death saves oh, and boy. so that had a couple implications it had the implication for the party as a whole where it's like we had tactics and those tactics broke down in character and so we need to address that and how all of the characters would feel right there's the realization that this world has much bigger things going on in it than we might necessarily be ready for. And then there's the, that character's realization that, you know, that's staring death in the face. And then his partner who was supposed to protect him and didn't. So all of these things from what to me was a like almost like a fill-in mm -hmm. a um you know they they were traveling and right. i needed them to just kind of see that the road was dangerous right and it became instead this really intense role play interaction and it kind of colored the way that they handled the next couple sessions and how they they did the mission that they were on and fulfilled their quest because there was more reticence. There was more talking. There was a lot of emotion and just kind of them trying to figure out their relationship with one another. And, um, and I took that and in the setting itself, that kind of changes the way that people who travel through that area might think about that, that space. Because if this is what that party goes through, right. what are other people who are experiencing something similar going to go through as well? Wow. I'm 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 just so fascinated by the by the depth that that exists in Veritas. Like it's just 
I, I'm, 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 I'm like really itching to like explore now. I'm like, what's, what's going on here? It's so, so what was your, what was your inspiration for, for creating Veritas? Like what's, I mean, I, I, I know you and your family have played D&D, but was there something that, that kind of sparked your imagination or, or what, what got you started down that, down that road? Honestly, it was just that sense of um, I had made the world way too big before. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of took the map of the world that I had created and just went, what is an area that no player has touched yet? And that was the area. And I was like, okay. It originally had a different name. um, And I was like, all right, this is the area that they're going to go in. And I'm just going to kind of build this out as deeply as possible. So honestly, it was a very, um, where the rest of the world was kind of just sort of that dallying, like, oh, I guess I'll do this here and that there. Like sitting down in Veritas had a lot more intention and a Mm -hmm. lot more like, what do I want to see in fantasy stories what would be interesting to me and how would that kind of, what would that interplay kind of look like? So there is, you know, I am a very, uh, I'm a very horror. I love horror stories, (laughs) horror movies, horror books. Same. So there's a lot of deep, dark woods. Yeah. Yeah. So um, a lot of woods, a lot of ruins, a lot of, um, uh, I, I was really into Tomb Raider as a kid. Cool. All that right. was, yeah, my first D and D character was named Laura Croft. She was a rogue. Um, Amazing. That's, that's <laughs> I just real quick because I'll because I because I, 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 I said this in our I think in our last episode how how much our our real life experiences kind of kind of play into our our character creation. And mm-hmm. like so many, like my favorite, it, it, it was so funny. So we were, we were interviewing somebody out, a friend of ours and her first character in middle school was, was named Calphalon because she was, she was into cooking at the time. And <laughs> that's funny. And one of my I favorite, love that. yeah, I, th- I thought it might, it's just like that, that kind of stuff. I just, I just love. And one of my favorite characters, um, was a a blind uh, tabaxi monk uh, named Draufganger, which is German for daredevil. So I I based it on the daredevil comic book character, and also my cat Dee Dee. Um, mm-hmm. But but I love that. I love that that that's that's where your 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 character came from. It's just it's, it, that's that's that. Those are the kinds of things that I, I just love so much that we can we draw from our own experience and and put mm-hmm. that into our. Our characters and I and I can tell you've done the same thing with 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 your homebrew world. You you you've put a lot of yourself into that, and it's it's just, it's just so tremendous. Um, Thank you. Let, let me ask you this question um, as, as we kind of wrap up here. So so what what would be your what what's kind of your advice for that that person that comes up to your table that has never played before, has kind of an idea about D anD D, but so what do you, what's what what advice would you give to that person who wants to play but has never played before and really doesn't know even what to kind of expect walking into a D&D game? Sure. I think that the biggest advice that I give anybody coming to a table, new or experienced, mm-hmm. is be generous with the people that you're playing with. So um, I think that generosity at a D&D table is what creates powerful stories it what's it's what creates immersion it's what um allows us to to really engage with one another in the environment so just it's okay to not know the rules right it's okay to not know which dice to roll um but coming in and and being kind and if you see that a player wants to try something uh what's it's that improv that yes and mm-hmm. see yep. 
see what you can do to help make that happen. Whether you're the DM or another player, um, I think, you know, like, like you were saying just a minute ago, we put ourselves into these characters and into these environments. And we do that with the hope of being able to do really cool things and tell really good stories with this part of ourselves that we've externalized. And how amazing is it that we get the opportunity to help our friends get to do really cool things with this externalized part of themselves. And so that's my biggest thing. I'm like, if you, if you come in, you come to the table, you're generous with the people that you're with and you're here to have a nice time and a fun time, then it's going to be great. And you're going to love it. Um, The rules are secondary. The dice rolls are secondary. It's about that collaborative storytelling. And it's about letting all of us take that piece of ourselves and do something really cool with it and help one another uh, do that too in that process. So that would be my biggest piece of advice is to come to the table and just be generous with the people that you're playing with. I, I love that so much. Elsie, thank you so much for your time. I, w- I want to make sure we cover this one more time before I let you go. The, the Light Keeper is is the novella which is available on Amazon. I will I will make sure we put the link yes. in the show notes as well so anybody that's interested in in checking that out what is is it? It was I think at the moment it was 99 cents. What's what's the what's the normal price for the book? For the it's novella? typically 2.99. Okay. It's, yes. I I scored it for 99 cents and I was like, "Yes." Nice. So even 290 <laughs> 2.99 is is a steal for this novella. It's fantastic. And what's the do you have the name of the first book? So the name of the first book, um, I think by the time the podcast comes out, it'll be revealed. So the first book is Veils of the Wayward, and it comes out February 13th. February and that'll 13th. be on, yes, and that'll be on Kindle and uh, physical copies. It'll be available both ways. Fantastic. I, I'm, I am looking forward to it. I will, I will definitely be buying a copy of that for sure. Uh, actually, is, is there anything else you'd like to share? Any, any other, anything else you'd like to promote or, or what, what else can we, what else can we help you with? Sure. So, um, if anybody is interested in playing in the world of Veritas, I release modules through my TTRPG company, Onyx Lunacy RPG. Um, so I have a module coming out next Monday, another one coming out in October. I released one in June. So a lot of these stories that I'm telling in the world of Veritas, if somebody wants to play them for themselves, I'm writing modules so that they can do that. So Fantastic. if they follow me on Instagram, you can find out more. Absolutely. And like I said, I'll, I'll put the link to that in the show notes as well. So, great. so everybody can get to it really quickly. Elsie, thank you again so much. This has been such a great conversation. I, so I really much. appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, I'll be reading your book soon. Thank you so much for having me. This is this has been wonderful. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Legends Loot and Lore. We hope you've enjoyed immersing yourself in the realms of legends, uncovering hidden loot, and delving into captivating lore. But the journey doesn't end here. For exclusive content, behind-the-scenes insights, and access to our community, visit legendslootandlore.supercast.com. There you'll be able to support the podcast, where you can join our Discord server for lively discussions and subscriber-only content, and connect with fellow enthusiasts. Stay connected with us on Instagram and Facebook at Legends Loot and Lore to continue on the quest. By following our social media channels, you'll be the first to know about upcoming episodes, bonus content, and exciting announcements. If you've enjoyed your time with us, we kindly ask you to rate and subscribe to this podcast. Your support means the world to us and helps us continue producing captivating episodes and embarking on new quests. Thank you for being a part of our journey. We're thrilled to have you by our side as we unravel the legends, uncover the loot, and delve deeper into the lore. Until next time.